All right, so let's take a virtual tour of Fort Necessity National Battlefield. So the flags you see here, this is the flag of the French uh, colonial empire in America. This is the flag of the British colonial empire. Now the French flag uh, at times had different numbers of these fleur-de-lis on it. Uh, some of them look like this, some of them had many more. Uh, so depending on where you were, you might see that looking differently. This map shows sort of an overview of the French and Indian War, uh, as well as the British and French settlements. So everything up here in green was a French settlement. It's a lot of where Canada is today. Uh, and in the Canadian province of Quebec, they still speak a lot of French, uh, especially in the city of Montreal. Uh, so you still hear a lot of French spoken there. Down here uh, in the east, like we talked about, was where the British colonies were. So you can see kind of how they sort of came together as the British moved further to the west and the uh, French moved further to the south and the east. They were inevitably going to sort of encounter each other, and that's kind of what happened here. Uh, they both felt like they were invading each other's land, so that's what uh, kind of brought them to fighting. So ordinarily, this will take us right from foot of 10 all the way to Fort Necessity. And actually the easiest way to get there, believe it or not, even though we're in Pennsylvania and Fort Necessity's in Pennsylvania, is actually to dip down into Maryland just briefly. So we'll start the bus up here. Okay. And there we are, we'll arrive here at Fort Necessity. Okay, and if you look out the window on the bus, then there you see the Fort Necessity National Battlefield and National Road Heritage Corridor Interpretive and Education Center. So, so the Visitor Center, the museum uh, here on the site. So uh, really neat museum. I hope someday you get a chance to go there in person and check it out because it really, really is a neat place. Uh, not only does it celebrate Fort Necessity National Battlefield and teach about that, but it also teaches about the National Road. The first National Road is U.S. Route 40. So that was the first road uh, really that was built uh, in the early 1800s. So it says here in 1854, George Washington suffered the first defeat of his military career. That battle was a prelude to a war for empire that eventually set the stage for the American Revolution. Whoops. During the 1800s, the United States' first federally funded highway passed by only a few hundred yards from here. The new route linked the Atlantic coast with the Ohio River Valley and helped make the country's westward expansion possible. Take a step back into history and witness the events that helped shape this country. I'm trying to find here my laser pointer option. No, I'm not seeing it though. That's okay. okay. Quest for Empire and the Battle for the Ohio Country. Before the first shot was fired at Jumonville Glen, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, it seemed inevitable that the French and British would come to blows. The only question was when. At issue was an area of land known as the Ohio Country. It spread west from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. So it's not the same as the state of Ohio today. The Ohio country was the area around the Ohio River, all the way from the Appalachian Mountains and out toward the Mississippi River. Many considered it the strategic key to controlling the North American continent. Now, the flash on my camera when I took these pictures kind of obscured some of the words. So that's why it kind of looks a little funny there. I had to retype some of what was there. Uh, so you'll see that on some of these slides. For years, the Ohio country and the American Indians who lived in it had served as an effective buffer between the French possessions to the north and west and British settlements to the east. It allowed the two traditional European rivals to share control of eastern North America. But in the early 1750s, trade disputes in the area disrupted the calm. And we talked about the fur trade, the fact that the French were trying to trade with the Native Americans and so were the British. So there were trade disputes, disagreements over who had the right to trade on this land. 
French and British soldiers marched on the Ohio country and asserted rights of ownership, ignoring longtime Indian claims to the territory. Remember, after the walking purchase, where were the Lenny Lenape sent? They were sent to the west. They were sent toward where Pittsburgh is today, and we're told that was the land they could have. So now we have the British there. We have the French there. The Indians feel like it belongs to them. So there are all kinds of problems coming into play. On May 28th, 1754, British and French troops opened fire on one another at Jumonville Glen. The battle for the Ohio country had begun. The French and Indian War would soon follow. War for Empire Whoever holds these rivers will control access to the western lands. The British claim it, but on what grounds? We, the French, have been traveling through here for decades, trading with the Indians and exploring where the British could never hope to go. We were here before them, and we will be here when they leave. See, that gives a good point of view of the French. We talk in history sometimes about primary sources or primary documents. This is a quote from someone who was there. So it's a French settler who was there, who was experiencing this and saying, this is our land. We were here first, and we're going to be here when they're not here anymore to bother us. In the 1750s, three great cultures collided on the ground where you now stand. The French were pushing south and west from Canada, while British settlers pressed in from the east, and the American Indians were caught in the middle. All laid claim to this land, and every group felt that they were in the right. The American Indian point of view here, it says the Indians who sided with the British, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy also claimed control over the Ohio country. And they considered the area an important buffer zone between the French and British colonial empires. They felt like they needed to keep them apart. They needed to have something that was separating the French and the British. That is why the increasing French military presence concerned the Iroquois Tanagrasson. Tanagrasson enlisted British help against the French, hoping to preserve the Iroquois advantage. Representing the powerful Iroquois Confederacy, Tanagrasson sided with the British in order to protect Iroquois interests in the strategically valuable Ohio country. Tanagrasson, the Iroquois Viceroy, or the Half King, as the English called him, led Washington to the secluded glen where de Jumonville, glen is sort of a wooded area, where de Jumonville, who was a French leader, and his band of French soldiers were camped. During the brief battle that followed, Tanagrasson and his warriors sealed off the French escape. Then the Half King himself, perhaps in a move designed to generate greater ill will between the British and the French, delivered the fatal blow that killed Ensign de Jumonville. So this Native American ally of the British killed the French leader Okay, during this battle, this very small battle. And we're going to read more about it here on the next couple slides. But it was a very small little battle. And the Native Americans were trying to kind of figure things out. The British were trying to figure things out, what was going on, what was going to happen. And as they surrounded the French, the British uh, and the Native Americans especially attacked. Okay. Staking a claim, and I'm sorry, this slide's a little blurry. The French aggressively increased their military presence in the Ohio country in an attempt to solidify their king's claims to the area. In April, French forces swept in and evicted the British, threw them out, who were building a fort on the forks of the Ohio. So the British had started to build a fort there. And the forks of the Ohio, remember, is Pittsburgh. That's where before the uh, Steelers played in Heinz Field and before the Pirates played at PNC Park, they both played in a stadium called Three Rivers Stadium. And it's because Pittsburgh is where those three rivers meet, the Allegheny River, the Monongahela River, and, of course, the Ohio River. The Allegheny and Monongahela meet to form the Ohio. So when they talk about the forks of the Ohio River, they're talking about where those rivers come together. Think about a fork in the road where the road divides. Well, these are the forks of the river. It's where the two pieces merge to form the river. And actually, in the 1700s, a fork only had two tines. It had two prongs uh, instead of four like they do today. So 
It really kind of looked like a fork when you look at it that way. Okay. <clears throat> they built a larger fort in its place and called it Fort Duquesne. A move toward war. In 1753, the French began building a string of forts from Lake Erie toward the forks of the Ohio River. That action sparked an immediate reaction from the British, who sent George Washington into the interior to ask the French to leave. Now, George Washington was a Virginian. He was not a Pennsylvanian. He was born and raised in Virginia. And nowadays, Virginia doesn't share a border with Pennsylvania. But in the 1700s, they did. It wasn't until 17 or until 1862, I'm sorry, during the Civil War, that West Virginia broke away from Virginia. And Pennsylvania does border West Virginia. So West Virginia at this time was part of Virginia. So the things happening in Western Pennsylvania were of very strong interest to Virginia because it was kind of right beside where they were as well. The West Virginia panhandle uh, that sticks up there alongside Pennsylvania was at that time part of Virginia. So they sent George Washington, this young Virginian, in uh, his militia to ask the French to leave. American Indians watched with concern as the Europeans geared up for war. Some decided to remain neutral. Others chose sides when it was to their advantage. All knew that the Ohio country would never be the same. Fortunately, I did not take a picture of the illustration that that caption refers to. So next time I go, I'll make sure I do that. Okay, this is a really important slide in understanding what was happening here and how this a whole conflict really started. I love this quote, and this is another primary source. Uh, the volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America set the world on fire. Okay, it's a great metaphor, isn't it? Set the world on fire. So it, what does that mean? Think about that. Okay. Well, it means it changed everything. It changed the world. It affected things all over the world. We talked and talked about how history is all about cause and effect. Well, there it is. We have this cause and effect. And wait until you see just how small this is. This is such a small event. Uh, but the repercussions of it, the effects that come from this one action are incredible. And it's one of the things I love so much about history is how one little thing can make a huge difference. So I've talked enough. Let's read. The fighting began around seven in the morning. So just imagine this. I love the imagery here. So it's seven in the morning, maybe a little foggy, still kind of dark. Okay. George Washington his Virginia regiment soldiers and their American Indian allies quietly crept into position. Can you picture this? French soldiers rising out of their bark lean-tos spotted them and shouted an alarm. Now, a bark lean-to means they just took chunks of bark, long chunks of bark, leaned them up against a tree or leaned them up against uh, a large rock, boulder, and used that as shelter to sleep. Yeah. So... We have the French kind of creep, or the British creeping into position. The soldiers from France are just waking up, and they see them. They see movement. They maybe hear a branch uh, that snaps as someone steps on it, or they notice some leaves rustling. But they find some. They realize something's going on. Shots ring out in an instant. No one knows who fired first. Washington's British colonials blasted two volleys at the French. Now, a volley is when all of the soldiers stand together and fire at the same time. So you've got these lines of British soldiers. This was line warfare, it was called. Uh, and that was the tactical style at the time, especially in Europe. So they would stand in a long line, shoulder to shoulder, and they would all fire together. And that was partially because of the accuracy of the weapons. They needed everybody to shoot in the same direction at the same time in order for the weapons to have any type of effect at all. These weapons were smooth bore muskets. They were accurate, maybe 50, 75 yards in the hand of a really good shot. Okay. So the British colonials blasted two volleys at the French who returned a few rounds. The French weren't ready. They were just waking up. So there were shots here, shots there. But they weren't in line to fire altogether before they escaped to the far end of the ravine. English allies Tanagrasson and his warriors circled around and sealed off the glen, preventing the French retreat. When the smoke cleared, 13 French soldiers had died, including their leader, Ensign Colon de Jumonville. 
From the Virginia Regiment, George Washington reported one dead and three wounded. None of the Indians who aided Washington were hurt. In all, the fighting lasted about 15 minutes. Wow, it's less time than we've been reading this. The fighting lasted about 15 minutes. In military terms, it was little more than a skirmish, but it set in motion a chain of events that would change America and the world forever. History is all about cause and effect. Because of this event, because George Washington was sent to talk to the French, and because Tanagrasson decided to go a step further and kill the French leader, it's going to lead to the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War, in many, many cases, is responsible for leading to the disagreements between America and England that resulted in the American Revolution. Now, I'm not saying we would have still been British citizens 250 years later later, uh, if not for this event, that probably wouldn't have been the case. But would we have gone through the Revolutionary War the way we did at the time we did? I don't think so. Uh, one of the reasons for the Revolutionary War, and we're going to get to this next, was because America was upset, and you may know this, over taxes, English taxes. Well, why was England charging us all these taxes? Well, they had a war to pay for. We had just come out of the Revolution or the French and Indian War, so in 1765, they passed the Stamp Act to tax the colonies and make up some of that money. This was expensive. They had to send soldiers all the way across the ocean, build ships to do that. Uh, feed the soldiers while they were here, provide uniforms for those soldiers. So they had spent a lot of money. They would spend a lot of money fighting the, the French and Indian War, and they felt like the colonies should have to help pay for some of that. That's where the taxes came from. And then we got upset about those taxes because we had no representation. We had no say in it. And that led us to demonstrations and then fighting and eventually war. So you can draw a direct line between this little 15-minute battle here in Western Pennsylvania all the way to the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, the siege at Yorktown, all of those events that would be coming down the road. Okay. But it started right there. British. George Washington's military action against the French at Jumonville Glen sparked an international controversy because the two sides were not at war. Immediately after the fighting, the 22-year-old British colonial officer defended his actions in a letter to his superior, Robert Dinwiddie, the lieutenant governor of Virginia. The battle was the first of Washington's young career. He was 22 years old. And although France and Britain were at peace at the time, he claimed that his attack on De Jumonville was the just outcome of a military encounter and part of his orders to defend the Ohio country against the French army. It's one of the things that's so fascinating about this to me. We always picture George Washington as President Washington, as an older gentleman. Uh, it's different to imagine him as a 22-year-old kid. Uh, the age of someone who's in college nowadays. So George Washington was a very, very young man. He wasn't the man you see on the $1 bill or on the quarter uh, at this time. He was a much younger man. Uh, so it's a different portrait or a different image. Even if we think about George Washington during the American Revolution, that's another 20 years down the road. He's in his 40s then. So much different uh, time here when he's just a young man, just learning about things, and just learning about life, really. The French were outraged by Washington's attack on De Jumonville, convinced that it was little more than an ambush, followed by a massacre. In the midst of building a fort on the forks of the Ohio River, the French sent their soldiers to observe and report on Washington's progress into the Ohio country. They contended that the small force of 35 soldiers under the command of Ensign Joseph Calon de Villers de Jumonville had been sent on a peaceful mission to ask the French to leave the Ohio country, a land they considered to be owned by the French king, Louis XV. So they were saying, hey, we're just on a peaceful mission. We're asking the English to leave the Ohio country. We weren't doing anything wrong. Why, why are you shooting at us? Why are you killing us? I can't believe you did this, England. Okay. A losing proposition. Here's another great quote. And this is by Tana Grisson, by the Iroquois leader. Washington lay at one place from one full moon to the other. Now, how long is that? One full moon to the other. Well, from one full moon to the other takes about 28 days. So we're about a month. Okay. 
So he lay at one place from one full moon to the other and made no fortifications at all, but that little thing upon the meadow where he thought the French would come up to him in an open field. Okay. So think about Tanagrasson's viewpoint there. How is he feeling about Washington and what Washington's doing? He's just laying there. He's not doing anything. He made no fortifications at all except this little thing on the meadow. And you'll see the little thing that Tanagrasson is referring to here in just a moment. But he's not very impressed by George Washington. He doesn't think he's doing a very good job. Uh, it goes on to say here, as Washington and his men built Fort Necessity, local Indians watched with great interest. They knew that it was only a matter of time before the French returned to avenge Jumonville's death, and they began calculating how they would react to the dispute. In early June, Tanagrasson, together with the Seneca matriarch, Aliquippa, matriarch means the woman that is in charge. Remember when we talked about the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, as well as the Algonquin, it was women who were largely in charge of those tribes. They were the ones that they sought for uh, permission to do things. They were the ones making a lot of the important decisions. So matriarch means the woman in charge. Her name was Aliquippa. Okay. They led 80 to 100 men, women, and children to the Great Meadows. There, Washington greeted and entertained them, but he barely had enough food to feed his own troops, let alone the new mouths. Disappointed by the lack of food and noting the small wood fort, the Indians decided that the British did not stand a chance, and they soon left. So, when Washington couldn't feed them, when he didn't have enough food, when he when they saw this little fort that wasn't really, there wasn't really much to it, they decided we're not going to sign up to support a losing side. And they decided there was no way the British could win this battle that was coming. Desperate for allies, Tanagrasson, because Tanagrasson still wanted to fight, but he did not have the support now from his tribe. Desperate for allies, Tanagrasson asked several Indian nations to meet Washington for a war council at Gist's Plantation, a frontier settlement about 13 miles from Fort Necessity. Once again, Washington does not have enough food or gifts to convince the Indians to join him against the French. Even Tanagrasson, the man who desperately hated the French, realized that the British were doomed. He too left before the battle began, leaving Washington without a single Indian ally. Preparing for the worst. We have just finished a small palisado's palisadoed fort in which with my small numbers, I shall not fear the attack of 500 men. Well, bad news for George. There's more than 500 coming. By the time George Washington and his men arrived at Fort Necessity from Gist Plantation on July 1st, 1754, they were hungry, worn out from weeks of cutting a road through a hardwood forest, and exhausted from the hasty retreat over mountainous ground. To make matters worse, the expected delivery of food, supplies, and reinforcements were not at the fort when they arrived. Washington ruled out further retreat east to Wills Creek, almost 50 miles away. The soldiers began to dig in, deepening the trenches that surrounded the fort and mounting their swivel guns. We'll see what a swivel gun is here in a minute. When they were done, fewer than 300 of the available 400 soldiers were fit for battle. So some of them were just exhausted. Some of them had become sick. Uh, some of them just couldn't fight. Okay. In the meantime, De Villiers, French Fort, now De Villiers here is the brother of the French leader that was killed. So Joseph Colon de Villiers de Jumonville, uh, this is his brother. De Villiers, French force of 600 soldiers and 100 Indians. We have 700 attacking. George said he would not fear the attack of 500 men, but he needs to fear the attack of 700. Indians advanced on the British fort. I'm sorry. 600 soldiers and 100 Indians advanced on the British fort. Rumors in the backcountry alleged that 5,000 English reinforcements were on their way. The French considered delaying their attack until a British deserter walked into the French camp and revealed the desperately poor condition of Washington's troops. So a deserter is someone who ran away from the army, who left. Uh, that was a crime punishable by death. So... 
very dangerous thing to do, but that British soldier deserted the army. He left the army. If he would have been caught, he would have been severely punished and possibly executed for that crime, Okay, especially when he gave information to the French. Wasting no time, De Villiers brought the full weight of 700 men down on the embattled troops of Fort Necessity on July 3rd, 1754. And another amazing little quirk of history. That date, very nearly the 4th of July, July 3rd, 1754. So we're still 22 years earlier than the actual 4th of July, the Declaration of Independence being signed on July 4th, 1776. So looking at this, uh, uh, just some of those little historical coincidences are always impressive to me. Okay, here we have an artist's depiction of the Battle of Fort Necessity. So these are the British troops. Uh, you can see those lines that we talked about. They're in these nice, neat, straight lines fighting in the British style. There would have been some soldiers inside this fort, but as I said, it was just a very small structure. So many of the soldiers were camping outside of the fort. You see their tents here off to the side. They talked about digging an entrenchment. So we have this large ditch sort of surrounding uh, along with some uh, wooden fence rails to kind of provide some protection as well. Uh, okay, now this is one of the exterior signs. So the other signs we have been reading were signs in the museum. This sign is outside of the museum. Uh, so it talks about from the, the British defenses. From the earthworks and stream banks behind you, the British fired back at the French and Indians. A steady rain dampened gunpowder and fouled muskets. Laying in water-filled trenches, the British soldiers' ammunition and morale began to dwindle. So they were running out of ammunition. Their ammunition was getting wet. Their gunpowder was getting wet. And when gunpowder gets wet, it doesn't work. These aren't like bullets today. Uh, their gunpowder and their bullet were kept separately. So they would put the gunpowder into the rifle or into the musket. Uh, then they would put the bullet into the musket. And so if the gunpowder got wet, if the musket got wet, uh, these were flintlock mu muskets. So if the flint, the little piece of stone, and we'll talk about flint and steel, uh, but there was a small piece of stone that would strike a piece of steel to make a spark. If that got wet, those guns are worthless. They are not going to fire. Casualties mounted. Dozens of wounded were carried or dragged into the stockade. The stockade is that wooden fort. About 30 dead soldiers lay in the mud. By late afternoon, the drizzle changed to a downpour. When it stopped, the British feared the worst. With few bayonets to counter a deadly charge from the woods, the British were at a great disadvantage. Then, about 8 p.m., a Frenchman yelled out, not in a battle cry as expected, but asking the British if they wanted to negotiate. Slide stuck there. There we go. So there is another view of Fort Necessity. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything there. Yep. So that is what Tanagrasson was referring to as that little thing upon the meadow. Now, this is a modern reconstruction. So this was built in modern times. The fort was not strong enough to stand uh, and nobody was taking care of it or anything after the battle was over. But that is what Washington's fort would have looked like. Okay. There's a closer view of it. Now, this is one of those swivel guns that we read about. So it's sort of like a cannon, except a cannon is usually mounted on wheels. Uh, this is a swivel gun, so it's just mounted to a post, and then it would be allowed to swivel or turn in different directions. So just a small caliber cannon there. And then here we have the earthworks. Now, during the battle, when these had just been dug, it would have looked more like dirt. Uh, over the years, of course, grass has grown over those areas. There was at this place a small staccato fort made in a circular form round a small house that stood in the middle of it to keep our provisions and ammunition in. That was written by Private John Shaw, who fought with Washington in the Virginia Regiment. This was written uh, almost two months after the Battle of Fort Necessity. The simple log cabin, so in the middle of that uh, 
round structure was a little log cabin, basically. And it provided protection from the elements and pilfering of British supplies. Flour, corn, salt, gunpowder, musket balls, cannon shot, and rum were the principal items in storage. Using one of the cabin's logs as a podium, British officers made a copy of the surrender document. So here we have that small log structure or small cabin inside. I believe they were still constructing it when I was there uh, and took these pictures. So uh, it eventually, I believe, would have had a roof on it. And maybe does now. I, like I said, I'd like to get back. I haven't been there in a few years, so uh, quite a few years, actually. So it's time to make another trip, I think. The French attack. July 3rd, 1754, dawned gray and drizzly. Mid-morning, about 700 French and Indians approached from the far end of the meadow toward fewer than 400 British soldiers in and around Fort Necessity. French Captain Louis Calon de Villers saw the British standing before their trenches in battle lines typical of European tactics, so they were fighting the way they always fought in Europe. But the French didn't fight that way. With a cry, the Indians and French advanced. Strategies quickly changed as the British withdrew into their fortifications while the French and Indians dispersed into the woods to surround the fort. Most of the French and Indians concentrated in the woods behind you were protected by trees and within accurate firing range. I'm sorry, were protected by trees and within accurate firing range. They held the advantage. So they were fighting from the woods, which was at the time by European standards, considered a cowardly way to fight a battle. But that was what was going to allow the French to be successful as well. As rain fell throughout the day, the French exchanged musket fire with the British, most of whom were lying in water-filled trenches. And remember what we said the water would do to those weapons. So this was the French position. They were hiding in the woods, surrounded by the trees, protected, spread out. So it was hard for the British to even find a target, let alone to hit that target if they could find it. Okay. Here's what those ones look like today. Okay. And there we see some of the uh, muskets that the soldiers would have been using. So these weapons were a work of art. They were absolutely beautiful uh, to look at, but they were flintlock weapons. And that means they used a small stone to hit a piece of metal that would make a spark and that would light the gunpowder. So that's the type of weapon we were dealing with. You see some of the soldiers, other equipment there as well, some of the bags and things they would have carried. Uh, so that just kind of shows you things would have looked like there. Uh, I like this message just because it shows that history is always changing. A lot of people think, oh, this was 250 years ago. It's never going to, it's not any different. It's boring. It's too long ago. Well, we're always learning new things. And that's kind of what this slide shows. It says here, July 3rd, 1754, Lieutenant Colonel George Washington fought his first battle, which marked the beginning of the French and Indian War in America. It says, in 1932, America celebrated George Washington's 200th birthday. As part of the celebration, the federal government opened Fort Necessity National Battlefield site, complete with a newly built reproduction of the fort. The large square fort looked like the forts commonly built in Washington's day. It featured a 12-foot stockade, firing steps, a cabin, a prominent flagpole, and visitor pathways. Bronze plaques mounted to the stockade provided guests with an overview of the events that had taken place there two centuries earlier. The memorial sparked little controversy at the time. Although a few historians questioned the shape of the fort, believing that perhaps it should be triangular, most accepted the reproduction as accurate. No one suspected that clues to a more complete and accurate story were lurking just below the surface of the battlefield. It says here, reconstruct new evidence, new light. Reconstruction was not a major concern when the work began, as the reproduction constructed in 1932 was believed to be correct as to details. In preparation for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Fort Necessity, so 1954, the National Park Service brought in Jean, I don't know if it's Jean or Jean, but we'll say Jean Carl Harrington to work on a minor archaeological project. 
Hoping to unearth a few relics, or perhaps locate some forgotten trenches, Harrington instead made a startling, if not accidental, new discovery. Fort Necessity had not been square, or even triangular, as some historians had speculated. It had been round, and much smaller than anyone had imagined. Harrington hit on the theory soon after he began digging in 1952. Over the next year, he used a new process that combined historical research with traditional archaeological techniques to prove his point. His discoveries convinced the Park Service to tear down the inaccurate 1932 fort and build a circular one in its place. Harrington's pioneering techniques helped cement his reputation as the father of historical archaeology and helped change the way historical sites are interpreted today. So we can always learn new things, and sometimes the things we think are true are not. Okay, so it's important to keep that in mind. All right, I think we'll stop there for today uh, because we've been talking for a while. You've been listening for a while. So thank you for your patience. And we'll continue next time because we're going to find out what happened after the Battle of Fort Necessity as we continue on with our story. So thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.